I'm Susan Mizrucki, and I'm the moderator uh, this evening. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming to the film and uh, for staying uh, for the question and answer. Um, it's my job to introduce um, Rebecca and Stephen, which is a great honor for me. Um, Rebecca Brando uh, is the daughter of Marlon Brando. Uh, she is a clinical psychologist, and she lives in Los Angeles with her two beautiful children. Stephen Riley is the director of the wonderful documentary that you've just seen. You can find the full list of his films on the SAG Foundation website. But two of particular note are Fire in Babylon, which won the Grierson Award for Best Historical Documentary, and the first ever documentary on the making of J the James Bond films, Everything or Nothing. Uh, so please uh, welcome Rebecca and Stephen. I should say that we we do have audience questions, um, but I, I think I was told that the protocol is to save them for the end. I think it may be because that's how they keep you all, um, you know, for the whole time. Um, so I'm going to indulge myself and, and ask some questions that I have, um, uh, Stephen and, and Rebecca. Um, I thought I would start with just a very basic question for Stephen, which is, um, what do you see as the film's primary messages? I mean, if you had to pick one or two takeaways um, for the audience, um, what is the film saying about Marlon Brando, and what do you hope people learn about Brando from uh, watching the documentary? Um, well, I was um, really fascinated. Um, uh, because of Marlon, I became fascinated in this idea of myth. Um, and you hear a bit of it touched upon in the film. Um, Marlon was looking into all sorts of myths. Um, he thought that myth was completely dominating in our thoughts, how much we need narrative in order to survive. And, um, and all of, you know, I mean, our, our profession relies upon that too, but narrative and myth is this kind of core principle. Um, and he was addressing that with the myth of, um, you know, his own family, the myth of his parents. Um, you see with the American Indian, uh, Native American Indians, the myth of America. Um, and then, of course, the myth of Marlon Brando. And these were the, and the myth of Marlon Brando was something that really governed my approach to the piece. I didn't know too much about him at all um, and had to learn um, um, pretty much everything from, from, um, uh, from, from scratch. Uh, I knew I'd seen his films and was um, you know, a big fan of all the big roles, of course. But um, the myth was something that I was you know, affected by. I knew that this guy had... Um, um, uh, was the best actor um, by popular um, vote, and um, and that also he was it wasn't he, he was a recluse, wasn't he? And there'd been that terrible um, uh, tragedy in the household, and and all this kind of stuff, and that's that dominated my perception of the man. But I think in the course of doing the film and researching him, spending a lot of time with him in editing the piece as well, you know, just spending loads of time with him on, um, on headphones, um, I got to really appreciate him as a very ordinary person, and I think that's probably my biggest takeout: that people understand the humanity of the man, and. Um, uh, and take him, you know, and, and really take him at face value and the person he always wanted to be. And, um, you know, kind of, uh, uh, and someone who was addressing the problems which I think we are all preoccupied by, you know, um, in terms of, you know, how to face life, what's meaning in life, um, uh, dealing with insecurities, you know, all this stuff. So his humanity, I think. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I was, I was curious too, you know, along these same lines about, about the title. Uh, because it's a it's a really intriguing title, and uh, and it's it's difficult to to title a, a you know a film or a, a book about Brando. I mean he's um, he's hard to uh, you know encapsulate, in, in, and I, I'm just curious how you settled on it and how the title is related to your sense of what the film is about. Um, 
Well, um, it was interesting, the whole sort of genesis of the project. You know, I, I was very um, lucky or happy to get the call from Passion Pictures, which is a production company I've directed a few films for now. Uh, and they asked me would I be interested in doing a film on Brando. And, um, and at that point, you know, the brief was very open, the approach was open. Uh, I asked, uh, of course, you know, what have we got access to and what have, um, you know, what's uh, the, 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 the estate and the family were behind the film. But as the qu question was, you know, was there anything that they might have had hold of for these 10 years since Marlon, Marlon's passing? And there was loads. I mean, there was just it was boxes and boxes of, of materials. Which, as you know, Susan's written a book actually on on Marlon, and um, and that's how we first got to know each other. And part of my research, I went to Boston to go and speak with Susan. Um, but um, uh, but I mean, Susan probably even combed through all the documents to much greater detail than I ever did. But everything was there. It was like it was it was. Um, um, reams and reams of creative notes and papers and books with notes in the margin and also um, uh, the uh, some tapes and there were these audio tapes and uh, there was there seemed to be a fair stash not nearly as many as would eventually come out but there was a fair few initially and I was very l lucky I realized now in retrospect with the first batch that I took and it was a selection of um, a handful of tapes maybe you know um, six or seven and amongst those was um, some intimate conversations he was having with friends um and um uh, which included some of his um you know his, his family st uh, his uh, life story and his uh, his upbringing um uh, obviously you don't hear the, the friends voices in the films because uh, because it was edited so that it was more of an address of Marlon to himself and to um, the audience but um uh there was also the uh, one of one of uh, a batch of self hypnosis tapes which you hear and uh, and it was just one of those refrains it's one of those things that Marlon was repeating to himself he said you know listen to me Marlon this is a listen to the sound of my voice um, and addressing himself you know constantly and it was you know it's a very you know uh, 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 impactful just hearing him um, you know uh, in dialogue with himself and so that was um, that was it. when I did the very first proposal. That was the title, you know. From then, and it was you know Brando on Brando, and that was there. I mean, though it was uh, that was it was a lovely ambition to start off with. But I, you know, soon got worried as to whether that was ever possible, and um, was um, trying to look at other routes just to make sure that we were covered. But the further the film um, went into production, and the more that I researched it, and the more tapes that came out, the more sure I was that that was definitely the way to go. And um, and uh, and everyone got behind it, which was great. And and we love this, the title, Listen to Me, Marlon. Um, and it's so funny because you ask a very good question because I remember your book, Brando Smile, we were having dinner one night and you thought, and you asked me and people at dinner, you said, what do you think about the title of the book, Brando Smile? Mm -hmm. And it's like you said, it's hard to find a good title, but that's a wonderful title. And I love Listen to Me, Marlon. It was a battle to keep that one too, <laughs> I have to say. but. Uh, it, it is, uh, you know, I, I was actually going to ask you, Rebecca, about um, whether people in the family saw him recording all the time. I mean, this was obviously something that he did. I mean, one of the amazing things about the documentary is how you manage to sift through the mounds of materials. I mean, there's so much stuff and so much audio and so many interviews that he did over the course of his life. And, you know, the process of selection is, is daunting. I mean, I, w I went through it too. And I, one thing I, I uh, wondered about is, uh, you know, did, did people, and, and also the other thing is he saved everything. I mean, he was a, a terrific pack rat. Uh, so I, I just wonder, did, you, did people see, did, was this something you knew he did? Did he tend to film family gatherings? Did he oh. have tape recorders? You know, do you remember him doing this? You know, um, <coughs> Well, uh, okay, so what I remember when I would walk in the house, I'd see him sitting at, for instance, if I came in and he didn't know I was up at the house, uh, he'd be sitting in the c on the couch in the living room and, and I'd sometimes sneak behind him and I'd hear him talking to himself and I and no, he wasn't talking to himself, he'd be speaking into a dictaphone. Mm -hmm. And um, as soon as he saw that I was there, he would stop speaking. Or he'd been in, in the bedroom and speaking into little cassette recorder, mm -hmm. and um, and so I never knew what he was talking about, but I just left it alone. I had no idea that he had the amount of tapes that he had recorded. I had no idea that it was over 300 hours of mm -hmm. tape recordings. But um, 
Uh, no, I did not know. And one time, I think it was after he had passed that we all got to go into the house and take some um, items that were very sentimental. And I remember opening a drawer and finding a, just a, a load of cassettes. And a lot of them were self-hypnosis. And so I, I had those for a while. And then I heard about the film being made. And then I turned over, I think, a lot of the cassettes you probably listened to. So. Mm -hmm. So I was really surprised by this mm -hmm. treasure that they found. Mm -hmm. so, so it was, um, in a sense, a kind of secretive thing, would you say, that he did? I mean, this is something he did. I don't uh, know if it was secret. Yeah. I, think, um, I think sometimes he would record friends, mm -hmm. but I, I don't know, unbeknownst to them, mm -hmm. sometimes maybe he did. I'm not sure. Stephen would know better <laughs> than I, because I haven't heard all the audio myself. Yeah. There was yeah. there was just a massive assortment. It wasn't yeah. like he was recording the, all the tapes yeah. for a certain reason. He'd record them for all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. There'd be just tapes where he'd just be doing little notes to mm -hmm. self, and uh, he might have read something interesting in a book, and then just you know speak a phrase from a book and press stop. Um, record you know vocabulary, just um, thoughts and ideas, L copious creative notes for um, his movie preparations, mm -hmm. which sort of dispels yeah. the idea that you know he wasn't prepared and that he was you know, quite cavalier in his approach to acting. He would meticulously plan and go through and you know, sort of explore ideas about you know, what's the foundation of the character. That was, that was interesting. I mean, you found that stuff as well soon, yeah. didn't you? Yeah. Which was you know, in terms of, um, um, you know, I mean, I, I think he was a perfectionist, in fact. You know, he could lose interest in a film. If, if, if the message wasn't coming across or if he wasn't in tune with the director, yeah, he could dig his heels in and be difficult, but that was because he, you know, we, I think he d might have started with a, with a, with a higher ideal and, and always wanted the best for a film, how even the, even the ones which aren't so celebrated. And, um, but, but, you know, all sorts of audio, you know, lo lots of different reasons. He'd record business meetings, he'd record, um, you know, stuff with his family, um, just, um, yeah, en endless stuff, but he just didn't throw them away. Like you said, he hoarded them, so that's why they were kind of available and could be collated from. It seems that you know there could be thousands more books and thousands more movies about all this, all this stuff. I mean, one of the, you know there were, um, I remember you know, recordings of him practicing his accents for for different films and interviewing his his old aunt. Remember Aunt June, the Aunt June uh, interview on the set of Sayonara. I mean, just endless amounts. And I guess that's a that is a question I'm curious about. How did you, I mean, you, you wove such a, uh, uh, a beautiful narrative um, out of the materials, but it must have been painful, too, for you to, to select and, uh, you know, include some things and not include other things. I'm just wondering. Um, well, it's, it's, I mean, once, once your sort of narrative track is kind of in place, yeah. I mean, there were some things which um, um, were, were, were defined and was cl I was very keen to do from the get-go. I mean, having it as this, you know, psychoanalysis in a way by Marlon on himself um, and then have some sort of investigation, which would end up being like a, you know, like a, a deep Freudian or, or dynastic investigation into how that terrible tragedy might have happened at the home mm -hmm. and, um, and um, seek any sort of explanation to that in terms of, you know, um, um, Marlon's history and family history, um, and then and then looking into the story of his of his acting and and developing developing you know the the the, the this quest for meaning that Marlon was obviously you know that was what really preoccupied him at the start of his life and how could his life you know how did his life end up and how did those events come to pass that was in that was in place so everything that didn't really serve that would you know however interesting would just would, would just naturally fall away anyway I and mean, of course there was loads of interesting trivia and and um, you know stuff that I'm sure um, film buffs would have um, got super you know excited about but yeah. but you know when you're when when the the the, the narrative is um, you know it's is has a direction you, you everything else feels like it's a um, divergence from that mm -hmm. we, I should ask a question that's directly about acting because of you know f on behalf of our audience and um, one of the things that struck me about the the arc the narrative uh, of the documentary is that uh, you have the the uh, beginning um, sort of the you know Brando falling in love with acting you know by way of Stella Adler and uh, coming into his own as an actor and then there's the sort of revulsion that comes you know as a consequence and part of uh, celebrity uh, and then it, it seems to me that the the uh, film comes back around to the idea that he accepted that acting was what he could do and he felt 
okay about that. He felt good about what he had done, uh, what he had achieved, uh, that he had been an actor. I, I'm just curious if that's, uh, in your view, an appropriate reading of, of what you're saying about acting and how the film is, is portraying his perspective. Do you, I, do you know, I, I, I think there were, in terms of the grand, you know, arcs of Brando's life, I think there were points, there were periods when he was a lot more um, idealistic and had, mu you know, really far-reaching ambitions for what film could achieve. Um, he was a big proponent of social realism. He really thought that through truth, you know, um, and through art, we could change society. Um, and, um, and I think that was something he firmly believed in, even right to the very end. But he developed a deep cynicism en route, and it might have been because of fame. It was also because of the way he felt he was mistreated by Hollywood and misunderstood. Um, it might have been because of these um, failed missions that he had for films that maybe didn't go the course he wanted. So there, was, uh, there were lots of frustrations on the way. But my feeling was that, you know, yes, those, 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 there were bigger dips at different points and, the, the, you know, the, the trends would develop. But I thought he, he could be, you know, you caught him in a good mood at sunset versus w when he got up, he might, you know, his attitude might have changed. But I think there was always hope with him. And he was a survivor. You know, I think that there's one thing to be said about Brando compared to everyone of his generation. He really lasted to the very end. And I think that he did get solace out of film. He would talk, you know, on many occasions about how he'd pull out tapes of Laurel and Hardy and, and um, Charlie Chaplin, as you saw there. He loved City Lights. And those would, you know, kind of take him back to a time when, um, you know, that idealism was um, very much um, uh, present and kind of uh, developed his, his artistic sensibility, I think. And, um, and, and those quotes at the very end, what's interesting, in fact, just to mention is when he starts saying that that um, that he realised, you know, that that his art and that films could actually provide a positive purpose. That, as it happens, was in conversation with Robin Williams, and um, and 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 Robin had helped him realise that, you know, and it was actually spending time with Robin that reminded him that, you know, that this was, um, you know, something which he should pay attention to. Um, but um, but it was interesting that you know, kind of like even Robin couldn't outlast. Um, um, you know, um, his own, um, yeah, you know, it was, it was certainly useful for Brando. Well, I wanted to say, um, you know, we, my dad didn't talk about his career at all in, in, at home. You know, he kept that separate from us kids, and so we never knew much about the actor. We only knew dad. And, um, but, however, one time he asked me, um, who is this kid, Johnny Depp? W what's he like? And, <laughs> and I said, Dad, you don't know who Johnny Depp is? You must do this film with Johnny Depp, please. And it was Don Juan DeMarco. And so um, it was a great film because um, I remember that was the only time he wanted me. Oh, actually, he asked me to work on the score with him one of his last films, and um, I wasn't able to because I was pregnant with my first child. But um, I remember after he had finished Don Juan DeMarco, he um, usually was, I was always told that, you know, just uh, dad just came back and he, he just wants to rest. He doesn't want to talk about the films and, you know, he's tired. And, and I remember after he finished Don Juan DeMarco, he was in really, he was in really good mood and he, it, and it was, it just, I just saw a different light in him. It was it was completely different. So, um, I think he he enjoyed it, and I like Don Juan DeMarco because I think that he really played himself in that film because he he was like a father figure to. I don't know if you've seen the movie, but of course you have. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's seen every film, um, maybe more more times than one time, but. Um, uh, yeah, no, she, he plays closest to his own personality in that film, and, and that's why I liked it so much, and I think he enjoyed it, too. You know, y I think you told me, um, maybe the first time we talked, that that was your favorite film of his, and, and you know, it occurs to me, I mean, we're sitting here, you know, duh, I mean, you're a psychologist. It's, oh, it that's is right. That's right. He played, a he played a psychologist. He plays a clinical psychologist. Yes, yeah, yeah. and so he would try to get uh -huh. behind the man uh -huh. behind Don Juan, and who uh -huh. is he, and... And Don Juan DeMarco, I mean, Don Juan was a womanizer, and yeah. so it was interesting. Yeah, he's, he's got this fantasy, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it is really interesting to think of, of your vocation in, in, in that light. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah it served me well, um, <laughs> or has served me well. It's interesting because, um, you know, it, for 10 years, it was really hard after my father died. Um, 
and and I had to I had a really long grieving process. But after this film, it's like everything in my life has been pieced together. I think of, you know, my dad didn't really talk to us about his humanitarian work, and and so this film really lit up my father in a different way. I mean, not I got to see the actor, I got to see the the human activist, and so when I piece my past in my life, I think of, well, maybe that's why I got into politics and I moved to Washington, D.C. to try to make a difference. Maybe that's why I became a teacher. And maybe that's why I became a you know, psychologist because my dad was you know, not, never directly telling me to pursue those careers, but indirectly a message seeped in to kind of, my dad, w w like you said in your book, he's, he, or my dad said, he was a citizen of the planet and always wanted to make a change and, and, and change the world for, and for the better. And, and so I think that was my inner drive as well. And so, and then that's clearly emphasized in this movie, which I hope all of you enjoyed very much. So maybe I should ask both of you, and, and maybe particularly Stephen, just about, uh, again, an acting question. Um, what you see as his legacy for actors and for acting? And maybe it's, it's also a, a chance to, I, I, I don't think I've ever asked you what your favorite Brando film is. <laughs> but I'm curious about that, too. So I, I, I always cop out on this question, because there are several, <laughs> in fact. I daren't say one. I mean, of course, I mean, Godfather, you, do, you can start watching that, you watch it right through to the end. Um, but um, I really loved um, Mutiny. I loved One Eye Jacks, the film he directed. I loved Burn, which was actually Marlon's favorite film as well. Um, but um, there's, there's plenty. I didn't realize he'd done, he'd, it was 39 or 40 films he did in the end. You don't imagine <laughs> it was that many. But um, uh, I think in terms of acting and his legacy, I mean, I, I had to try and figure it out. I was thinking, like, why is this guy so you know, revered and you know, what was so impressive about him? I saw that, that opening scene in the, from the film A Streetcar um, where um, uh, he meets um, where um, Stanley meets um, Blanche, Vivian, Vivian's character. And I think just there, I mean, I'm sure everyone's seen it already, but just in that moment, you can just, I, suddenly I got it, and I just, okay, right, there we go. That's, that's it. I could see the old school and the new school coming together and the different styles of acting just in that one scene. So, um, so that was pretty obvious. But, you know, but going forward, you know, um, uh, Brando always felt that he was sort of stereotyped as this Stanley Kowalski character, and it would catch up with him in different ways. But... Um, but I was just really impressed when I stepped back about you know the range of hi of him as an actor that um, that I didn't really find people necessarily writing about so m so much you know in other books I read that mm -hmm. that you know the fact that he, you know how impressive it was that he mm -hmm. that he he tried to act outside of his own culture and and his own ethnicity even you know, on many occasions and he um uh, you know from playing in um you know it's a, a perhaps a smaller step to play an Italian American but then playing a German in the Young Lions and a Mexican in Viva Zapata and by the way taking on the accent and the look and you know and having his you know it's uh, I mean in Tea House when he plays a Chinaman as well I mean he really he really goes for it I mean it's kind of brave stuff and you're risking your whole name on it as well and your reputation and um and he kept talking about that for, for someone who I think was intrinsically quite vulnerable and and nervous and did actually really appreciate the help hand of a director as much as he had rocky relationships with, with directors I mean I think he really valued when directors went into the trenches with him um, that he was taking these really big risks and and um, and was never content to do something you saw at the end you know he wants a microphone in his coffin to say do it differently and that was his whole um, mantra I think about um, you know he'd say take a leap off the high board and you know push yourself and just try something try something new and I think that's really part of his legacy that you know it's that that I came to appreciate because I just I mean I mean even now just to try and list actors who've ever tried that breadth you know you know didn't play a foreign um, character and and uh, uh, in their own accent you know is quite quite impressive he's a very good mimic you know as well amazing yeah really and it's, it sounds like that was something that came from when he was a kid I mean that he as a little kid he would just pick up a southern accent because he, you know, was hanging out with these kids from Tennessee, you know, when, when his mother was doing summer stock, and it's, it is kind of, uh, it's one of the great things. Do you do you remember that? Do you remember him doing imitations or? No, I just remember him telling really good jokes about, <laughs> you know, just people's using people's accents, uh -huh. Jewish accent, uh -huh. Italian accent, uh -huh. you know. 
Irish accent, but no, never mimicking sounds of birds or uh -huh. cats. Like I love that cat sound he did in oh, Streetcar totally Named Desire. Yeah. <laughs> that was totally improvised. And uh -huh. um, and then yeah, yeah in, in Streetcar Named Desire, when he says ha ha, when he's when he says to Vivian Leigh. But anyway, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, from my dad. Well, sorry. Um, <laughs> let me think of one, and I'll get back to you. Well, I'll, I'll say one, I'll say one thing while while you're thinking of a joke, which is that he um, he seems to have been able to convince people that he knew like I don't know a dozen languages. I mean, he does seem to have known about probably probably four or five well Spanish. Yes, yes, um, he did. He um, Japanese. Well, my mother is Mexican, or yeah. she was Mexican. She passed away in, in mm. February, and he would say, talk to me in Spanish, and we would speak in Spanish. And I was always amazed at how well he spoke, actually. And then um, he spoke French very well. French, right. And I remember when um, um, he was visiting France and he'd speak to people in French, people were always just like wowed. He, mm -hmm. I couldn't, I, I was wowed and I went to school, to French school, private school for like 10 years. And, mm -hmm. and he just learned it and you know, not mm -hmm. too long, it didn't take him long. And he had a um, Japanese girlfriend for about mm -hmm. 14 years or? Mm -hmm. Yachio, and um, in order to um, really get get permission to court her, he had to meet her parents because she was from old school, very traditional Japanese family, and he learned Japanese, and they were very impressed with his Japanese. Um, and I remember when we were in France, just on the border of uh, Germany, um, we went to a cafe, and um, it was myself and Avra, and my sister Cheyenne, and he, we were sitting, and then um, next to us was this table, this old old couple at a table next to us, and they kept looking at him, and he he was look he was feeling uncomfortable because he they kept staring at him, and then um, he he knew something was going to happen, and sure enough, they were about they were looking. She was in her purse looking for a piece of paper. And and she got out a piece of paper and a pen and was about to ask him for his autograph. And that's something that he just did ha not have any tolerance for when people would come up to him and ask him for an autograph because I think he was always embarrassed and he en enjoyed being very private. So anyway, that was about to happen. So what he started to do was he started to talk to us in German. <laughs> and then... We thought, what What are you doing? Why are you talking to us in German? But we were so dumbstruck, and he was so convincing, and I thought he was just acting and trying to, you know, practice a monologue. But then, um, and so then the people just stared at him and thought, no, it couldn't be. And they, and they put back the paper and pen. And so he fooled them, and he didn't have to sign an autograph. He, he does. He does speak German in the Maisel's documentary that you um, use uh, uh, quite a bit of in in your film. And uh, you know, the big question was Yiddish because apparently he he was able to convince a lot of people that he was fluent in Yiddish because he was his, his you know, intonation, you know, everything was perfect. Um, and again, not clear whether it was true fluency or it was his amazing acting abilities. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I knew that. He, I yeah, he knew Yiddish, and he was just he just loved the words to to play with. I know he learned it from the Adler family, mm -hmm. and who adopted him as yeah. a as a family member, and so he spent a lot of dinners with them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I I have let me ask one last question of, of um, maybe Stephen and, and and Rebecca. You should answer if if you have an answer to this, and then I'll turn to the audience questions, and th and that is. Do you feel, Stephen, that you know him at this point? That you have a, a, a uh, what, can, what would I say, a, a, um, a handle on who Brando was as a person after doing all this work, after spending all this time with, with all of his materials? Um, I mean, I'll just mention that one of the um, images that I always had in mind when I was working on my biography was this Paul Clay painting that was made in 1924, that's the year that, that Brando was born, and uh, it was called The Actor's Mask. And it's all, you know, the, at the Im I mean, Clay himself talked about it, and he talks about how elusive the consummate, you know, actor personality is. And, you know, I always had a feeling of, you know, have I really gotten him? I mean, it's a, 
he, he's, a, uh, he, he's a tough nut to crack, Brando, and I'm just curious what your feeling is at this point, having done this, this marvelous piece of work. Um, do you feel like you, you have a, a, a good grasp on who Brando was? Do you know, I, I think it would be sort of arrogance <laughs> to suggest, yeah, I kind of, I, I know him inside out. I, I remember a time when I didn't really know him at all, and I remember thinking, actually, this is really confusing, and it was a, just a whole bunch of contradictions and contrasts, and until things just started slipping into place more and more, and, and, and actually I'd start to form a bigger picture, and I'd un understand dynamics um, with himself, with other people, um, realizing that he could hold two contradictory views at the same time, and both of them were equally valid, but, but as we all do, as well, and uh, yet he liked to inhabit the extremes. He liked to be playful. You know, he could be these things all at once. You know, he could be, um, you know, the womanizer and the romantic, or the idealist and the cynic, and you know, just to name but a few things. But I, you know, I could, I, I felt that I could read between the lines m uh, much better, and got to the point where I felt like I did have confidence that I, I genuinely liked him. And that was that was that was good to arrive at that conclusion when you know, and um, um, you know, no, uh, it just it just made it just more effortless in 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 you know in actually uh, you know celebrating him because um, you know for my part I enjoyed spending time with him. Mm -hmm. It was nice. It was always lovely. Even though I had the transcripts and I'd go through, you know, of a day, there'd always be something that would be funny and a nice moment and something amusing that you know just cheer you up. And there was it's just full of surprises even when. Um, you know, it was a. Uh, it's it's peculiar that you do develop a bit of a friendship, you know, over the course of that, mm -hmm. over the course of the time, just um, just by uh, association. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I I would agree with that. And uh, I guess Rebecca, you know, it's. Uh, I suppose you've already talked a little bit about what you learned about him from the film, but could you could you isolate a cup? You know, you talked about him as a uh, an activist. Yeah. Um, um, I think uh, just from a personal view, a uh, very personal level, is I think that he just speaks to you, to to the person, to you know. I, I like what Stephen brought about in my father is that you know everyone wants to be accepted, everyone wants to be um, validated, and 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 a contender, and and I. I really like that about my dad because everyone regards him as this enormous superhuman type supernatural actor and yet he was just like you and I. Okay, mm -hmm. so maybe I'll turn to the um, the audience questions and uh, I think these are looks like some of them are for Stephen and some are for Rebecca. The first one is uh, I have been a fan of Marlon Brando since I was a child in the 50s and saw him in The Men. Uh, when and what was the phenomenon which led him to be the actor's actor? So that's the question. Um, I think, do you know, I think if you trace it right back, I think it was happening really early. I potentially it was even happening before Stella because, I mean, I, I came across some um, anecdotal uh, material that said that even his mum, because his mum was a... Um, uh, was involved in the theatre and actually was uh, she was didn't she teach um, yeah, Henry, she Fonda, Henry Fonda teach yeah. Henry Fonda yeah. and uh, and she'd say to Marlon uh, apparently from a young age you know don't um, stop acting yeah. you know you're acting and stop yeah. acting so I don't know whether this I mean it, whether an actor's actor means just like a you know a true exp um, uh, proponent of the method mm -hmm. or not mm -hmm. or just um, you know somebody who really tries to access truth I don't know whether that's that's the interpretation of it or someone who just um, you know acts in a more mm -hmm. convincing way. But um, uh, I think that schooling was, you know, sort of um, very, uh, very early on. And I think in many, in some respects, even though he said he arrived at act acting by accident, I think there was something a bit preordained about it. You know, he was getting praise at, from his drama teacher at Military Academy. You know, he did realize that was the way to get attention from his mother, perhaps, was through acting. You know, he knew that in mimicking people, he'd, he'd maybe get the attention he craved too as a young boy. So, um, so wrote all paths were kind of were leading that way and and he had an he had artistic ambitions mm -hmm. um you know so um they were um mm -hmm. i think they were sharpened when he got to new york but i think they were probably there from a young age yeah yeah no. i'm not sure that answers the question at all in fact <laughs> but there we go so the next question is what did you enjoy most about making this film 
Um, I think it was just a really nice creative challenge. It was just great to um, have to think around ways of using the talking head. And, um, and it wasn't that obvious initially, in fact. You know, I mean, I think uh, even though there was some of this archive available, as, as I mentioned, there was no idea about how much of it would eventually come out, and it was coming out right the way to the very end. But, you know, it was um, it, because there hadn't really been um, um, a precedent or, or many precedents at all that I knew of, of, you know, telling the story entirely in the voice of someone who was deceased, that was, you know, an exciting challenge as much as it was terrifying. Um, so... Um, you know, that was, it was nice. It was just nice to be sort of, you know, just doing something very different and experimenting with the form and, you know, to test it, challenging yourself. So, um, you know, that was, that was, um, uh, I enjoyed that. And uh, this is a question for Rebecca. It's uh, later in Marlon Brando's life, did he ever come back to New York City with you uh, and walk the streets? If so, what was that like? Oh my goodness, I wish. We had walked the streets together. I actually thought about that today. It would be wonderful. I've been here so many times. I love New York City. Um, but he, I, I, you know, I was wondering if Car he lived above Carnegie Deli. Yeah. And is that the same Carnegie Deli? Is that the same location? Yeah. yeah. So then he lived right above Carnegie Deli. And my mother actually lived in New York as well. And so um, I think she lived on 52nd and 6th somewhere around there, so. But no, I wish my dad, I, I, and then on the way back, we were up Upper West Side today, and then we went d back down to downtown, and we drove by perhaps the new school, is that the same? Is it the same? Yes. Yeah. And I asked our driver, is that the new school, like the new school? And he's like, I don't know. <laughs> and I thought, how do you not know that? Great, great experience. I think you've already answered this question, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll ask it, and you can say that you've already answered it if you have. Um, the, it, because it's about uh, being you know, the daughter of uh, an actor. Did he bring his, his work home? And uh, did you um, experience you know, uh, being the daughter of, a, of, an, of an actor firsthand? I mean, there, this is, was it confusing to be around him at home? That's the question. That that's a good question, too, because it was very confusing. Um, on the one hand, outside of the home, um, you know, uh, if people saw my driver's license or credit card, they would always ask, oh, are you related to Marlon Brando? And sometimes, because I was so brainwashed and always being private and not publicizing who, we w who I was, I would sometimes lie because I would get very embarrassed if someone suddenly paid more attention to me and, and, and stared at me funny. Um, other times, um, you know, it was quite, we, we got a lot of privileges. I mean, we got to go on, you know, um, we got, if, if we needed to get into a, a fancy restaurant, we got in right away. It was, that was kind of nice. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the only way uh, I knew that my dad was so, was so large in, in life because the way people treated me, um, however, in, in at home, no, we never talked about that at all. We never talked about his acting. In fact, this is how, um, when I was young, maybe around my daughter's age, who's in the audience, um, uh, I was 11, and um, oh, my dad loved to sing on, on a whim. He would sing standards all the time. He'd just say, give me a title, and I'll sing a song. And uh, so I'd say, Moonlight, and so he'd sing Oh, I don't know, a song about Moonlight, I'm sure someone knows. But anyway, um, my point in saying this is that, uh, oh God, I'm so sorry. Um, let's see. Oh, um, when I was at Senna's age, I said, oh dad, do you know um, Luck Be a Lady tonight? <laughs> And he, I was sitting across from him in the living room, and he was stopped, dead stop, in reading the newspaper and looked up and said, are you joking? <laughs> and I thought, no, I'm, what? what did, I don't know. I love that song. I went to Las Vegas with, um, you know, a cousin of mine, and they kept singing, luck be a lady tonight. Can you sing it? Because he would love to sing. And so he didn't answer my question because I thought he thought that I was pulling his leg. Did, how, how did you find out that? Well, you know, then, <laughs> it, 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 because of his reaction, I thought, oh, there, there must be some connection. <laughs> and so later, of course, it was in Guys and Dolls. That's, wow, that 
Jesus. So that just goes to prove that I knew we didn't know much about my father's <laughs> acting. <laughs> we had, oh, time is up. So we have to stop? I get, okay, we get a couple more questions. Okay, so one question I had actually is whether both of you could talk just a bit more about the, you know, these two highly controversial moments in, um, in the acting career. I mean, one is the turning down of the Oscar, and the other is the, um, the uh, chaos um, over Apocalypse Now and the battle with, with uh, Coppola. And I just wondered um, if, if you could talk, Stephen, a little bit more about your sense of those events um, and uh, maybe, Rebecca, if you have any memories of, I mean, one of the, the story I heard was that he had two television sets turned on at his home and he was watching the Oscars with your brother Miko and, and maybe Christian and, and he was, um, you know, just very, um, I mean, he was, a, he was the ultimate spectator of this amazing event. Um, but I wondered if, if you have any other inside information about that and, and I also just, just wondered if, if you had more thoughts about it, um, Stephen, about the significance of that event? Um, well, I thought, well, actually, so so it, there's uh, an interview online, which um, um, some of you might already have seen, but it's with Dick Cavett, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a clip of it in the film, and you see Dick Cavett, obviously, uh, starting to interview Martin about the issue of the, um, uh, hi, uh, the his supporting of the cause of the Native Americans, and, um, uh, and Marlon t explains actually in the rest of that his whole approach to 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 that evening and and of course at the time I mean it's hard to sort of to imagine how controversial that might have been that you basically just you know just um, uh, upstage and um, uh, ruin as far as many were concerned you know the big celebratory event of the of the film calendar the Oscars um, but um, I, I I mean I just think that history would just like, bear him right in a way. I mean it was he yeah. did want to access that audience. I mean either you believe that he just did it for his own mm -hmm. self um, um, aggrandizement, mm -hmm. or else you mm -hmm. think that he did it because he genuinely felt mm -hmm. he had a heartfelt reason to do that. Mm -hmm. And I don't think he wanted to attract any more attention to himself. I mean that was the kind of um, mm -hmm. you know the, the 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 least thing he'd ever sought in his um, in his private life. Um, I just, um, you know, it was an interesting kind of rec point of reckoning for America to actually even discuss that. Because I remember growing up and watching, yeah, cowboys and Indians, and that was it. The Indians were the bad guys I played as a kid, and we'd go shoot up the Indians and run around, and you'd be really depressed if you had to be the Indian. Uh, you know, if someone, if someone picked you to be that, you know, I want to be the cowboy. So I was kind of sold on that as well completely. So to, um, so to actually, you know, to listen to that and to realize that it was a, a you know, count, it was a revisionist history. And, um, you know, Marlon really felt that the mark of a mature nation um, was a nation that would actually admit to those things and be honest with itself. And so that, that's really the mark of a civilized nation, to have that discussion. Um, so, you know, I think it was important to do that. No, I, yeah, I, I agree with that, and I think the self-critical um, aspect was just was enormously important to him. And one of the things Dick Cavett says in that interview is that is that Brando was, you know, from the '50s, uh, like the late '50s, he was already, um, you know, talking about uh, the, you know, the grievances of the Indians. And apparently, in, in the late '40s in Paris, he was talking about an ambition to do a film about the American Indians. So. <laughs> You know, these were really long-standing, you know, preoccupations, and I, uh, you know, it does seem, uh, you know, like like uh, a fulfillment of something rather than a departure, um, you know, which is which is the way Hollywood seems to have responded to it. Um, what about Apocalypse Now? I mean, what's your sense of that? Um, well, um, well so, so I watched Hearts of Darkness. I think everyone's sort of seen that film. It's one of the great documentaries, and it's all about the behind the scenes and the making of Apocalypse Now. And um, and I'm a huge fan of Coppola, and you know, I love Apocalypse, love Godfather, all all, all of his stuff. But so it was interesting, uh, you know, the, the 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 line from the documentary was that Marlon arrived on set. He was overweight. He was difficult. He was extending the schedule, and it was all, you know. 
kind of um, a lot of the problems were down to down to him. But the more I looked into it, the more I thought personally was that maybe the full story wasn't uh, you know out there. And um, and as much respect as Marlon had for Francis, and he and I think he genuinely did. He was one of the few directors that Marlon really enjoyed working with and respected. I think he felt mistreated. Um, with um, especially with the article in the Life magazine that came out that said all of these th same things, um, and um, and you know when you looked uh, into the uh, for example the tapes and look at the original script for Apocalypse and just see you know how far things moved on in terms of Marlon's portrayal and what he actually at the what he brought to that character, um, you can see that there was actually you know um, a huge contribution and that he you know he when he said I rewrote the entire script I think he's talking about his own script he's talking about Act Three largely, and um, and and I you know when you re rewatch Arts of Darkness you know there's this there's admission um, that. That things had really hit the the the, the buffers. That, that there that there wasn't a script. Um, Coppola says, and you got a choice. What you do? You either halt the production and go away and rewrite for a few months, or you do improvisations with one of the best actors on the planet, <laughs> or the best actor. And that's what he chose to do. So the fact it went over by two weeks, I just thought, well, you can't really, you know, have your cake and eat it. You can't, you know, just do that, go that route, and um, and then complain that it went over, you know, and uh, and, and Marlon. Uh, had these tapes and tapes and tapes of his preparations for the character of Kurz, um, where he was just riffing and ad-libbing and you know just doing tapes of improv, all around stuff that he was interested in. Um, he said that that um, that you know it was his uh, suggestion to innovate with the character and turn Kurtz into a, a very um, arch, malevolent figure who was supremely um, intelligent and could actually rationalise pure evil. Um, and um, and that's really what Marlon wanted to do was to make sure that that was kind of communicated, and so he set about doing that. And I mean, when you see the, you know, the, again, the, the um, I mean, that, that that's 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 my feeling on it. That, and and I, and I think that you know a lot of evidence might bear that out. That Marlon had a right to reply on that yeah. one. Yeah. And um, you know, and I think even you know, um, there were, I hear various stuff. I mean, I've come to see apologies from from Francis, and then heard elsewhere that you know that, that that story's still bubbling, or that you know that idea is. But um, I think that the Marlon um, really immersed himself in that part. There's no question, and he said that he felt that he, you know, he went over the edge with that. You know, so such, such was his commitment to it. So I think that deserves, um, um, you know, recognition. Yeah, no, I agree, and I think the record. I mean, all the materials really, you know, do, uh, you know, support the the work that he did. In fact, um, you know, one of his, I don't know if, if this crowd knows this, but. Uh, Hannah Arendt was uh, his favorite philosopher, and and he was reading a lot of um, he was he was reading Eichmann in Jerusalem when he was preparing uh, the dialogue for Apocalypse Now, uh, and also cr I think Crisis in the Republic, and he was really read he read a lot um, for that part, and and you know as you say did a lot of preparation. So, you know, how this, many this books did he have? <laughs> over four thousand. <laughs> he had over four thousand. Yeah, I thought it was over six hundred. Over 4,000 yeah, books? You know that. <laughs> wow. I thought you knew that. There were, there were um, seven, over 700 books on the American Indian alone. I mean, it was a professor's collection you know, of, of books on the American Indian. I talk about all this in my, in my book. I, I, you know, I'm sorry to, to, no, to don't do a be plug. Sorry. It's but a great it's, book. It's Brando about, it's, about, it's about the books. The tape, the books are everywhere. The books were sold off by the estate and the, f the and the annotated um, film scripts. Um, so they're all over the place, um, owned by private collectors. Uh, but the uh, the tapes are in this amazing vault where Stephen and I both worked. This um, sort of it's like a space capsule in Hollywood. You know, you need a special pass to get in, and it's refrigerated, so you have to wear snow jackets while you're working. Um, actually, this leads to my last question. I think uh, just one last question, which is that when I was working in this vault um, late at night by myself, uh, one of the things that I sometimes thought, you know, sitting there surrounded by all these boxes with Brando's personal papers and love letters and all this stuff, I often, you know, imagined him walking down the hall, you know, his ghost showing up and looking in at me in this space and saying, what the hell are you doing with all my stuff? <laughs> and I guess my question, um, Stephen, is how do you think he would view the film? I mean, do you have a, I mean, it's, it's an impossible question, and you don't really have to answer it, but I, I thought about that myself in terms of my, my book. Would he, 
dislike the fact that I spent all these years reading over his shoulder. Reading his marginalia. And Do you know, I don't know, but it was a crisis I faced very early on. I mean, from listening to that first self-hypnosis tape, you know, I knew it was something kind of like very special and, and intimate and profound, but I felt like immediately like I was intruding on someone's, mm -hmm. you know, very private thoughts. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and it was, um, you know, something which uh, worried me a bit. I, d I did think that, um, you know, this uh, this is something which w w would have been, you know, just his worst nightmare, um, having somebody rifle through it. And I, I'm same for me. I mean, I can't imagine anything worse than someone just ferreting through all my s private stuff. I mean, um, how awful. Uh, but um, but I think the only thing was was like, you know, just really understand at least uh, empathizing with that and understanding it, knowing that he felt misrepresented through the course of his life, knowing that he just actually really felt that he was attacked by the press and chose not to respond in many cases because he thought it was a futile exercise and didn't want to stoke the flames. And, um, you know, and just the l and, and I think this was again just in tribute to the fact that he's he's bringing all this stuff up. He's actually really ad uh, was interested in addressing these ideas of myth, mm -hmm. and um, you know to allow him to bring the audience that to our attention, mm -hmm. and you know make uh, and turn it into a sort of reflexive exercise about you know what are we doing when we go and watch him, and how does that what does that say about us, and what's this need to venerate and worship and. Um, you know, I thought it was great. I thought it was a really nice redress and a way for you know him to, um, you know, kind of set the record straight in, t in some degree on his own character. I mean, how do you summarize a life in, you know, 97 minutes? But you know, but you know, but just do, you know, just any kind of a clawback on who he really was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, he saved all these things, and you know, you do wonder about you know him wanting someone to discover it and make a, an empathetic portrait. Like well, I wonder. I remember initially that was kind of like the back of my mind. I was thinking, you know, oh, maybe this is serendipity. Maybe maybe it was all very, you know, meant to be. And Marlon really wanted this. I mean, I don't know. Certainly, kind of, you know, fortune did mean that these tapes weren't destroyed, and they did stick around, and and they were available. And there was a moment, as you hear at the beginning of the film, you know, he did have a plan to do a personalized documentary. There was definitely that, and there was, and he was prepping for that, and talking about, you know, doing something that was really, you know, intimate and on himself. So that was nice too. That was nice. It was comforting to, to be aware of the fact that he, you know, that was something he actually had thought of um, so um, um, yeah I mean I, I you know I, I hope he wouldn't cringe at it I hope he'd appreciate it and um, you know and it was always a nagging voice like you say in terms of the your corridor the ghost <laughs> up the corridor you know that was it as there was, a, there was a, always a um, uh, you know a private question as to you know what would uh, Marlon think of any cut you know any finishing and finishing any sequence I think we are supposed to stop so thank you all for coming and thank you for thank this you. beautiful film. Thank you everyone.